attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I just wanted to give you a brief welcome before we get started. I'm John Bogger, Program Manager at the Center for Contemplative Mind Society at Northampton in Northampton, Massachusetts. Currently, our central initiative at CMIND is the Association for Contemplative Mind and Higher Education, a multidisciplinary and international academic association with a membership of over 900 educators, staff, students, and researchers committed to transforming higher education through contemplative methods. And I would like to welcome you to our January 2017 Contemplative Education Webinar, Mindful Tech, with our presenter, David Levy. Professor Levy will offer a 45-minute presentation, including a contemplative exercise with technology, followed by a question and answer period of about 10 minutes. At any point during the webinar, you will be able to type questions into the GoToWebinar control panel, which has probably docked itself onto the right-hand side of your webinar screen. Your questions are viewable only to David and myself, and so when we come to the Q&A period, I will read them aloud so that we can all hear them. And just to note, we are not using the hand raising function for this webinar. So if you have questions, just type them in. You can listen to the webinar through your computer's audio, or you may choose the telephone option and dial in using the phone number and access code provided when you select the telephone audio option. If at any point in the webinar you lose your connection or otherwise encounter technical difficulties, you can always leave the webinar and log back in using the link that was emailed to you. We are recording this session and we'll post it on our website soon, so you'll be able to reference it again. We'll send you a link to the recording and a follow-up email. And now I'd like to give you a little background about our presenter. Dr. Levy is a professor in the Information School at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, David has been highly engaged in the association for many years now as a presenter at our conferences, and he is also a member of the board at CMIND. Related to today's webinar, David has also published an article on developing a more contemplative and reflective use of digital technology in the third issue of the Journal of Contemplative Inquiry that we published here at CMIND just last month. David is also the author of the critically appraised book, Mindful Tech, that was recently published by Yale University Press. So with that, a welcome to everyone, and welcome, David. John, thank you very much for that introduction, and hello, everyone. I'm really delighted to have a chance to talk with you today about the work I've been doing for many years to help us establish healthier and more effective relationship with our digital devices and apps. As you see on this uh, overview slide, um, what I'm going to be doing over the next um, 45 minutes is first, I'm going to give you a little bit more introduction to me and, and um, how I came to do the work that I'm going to be describing. The heart of the presentation will be looking at this course that I've been teaching since 2006 called Information and Contemplation and the specific exercises that have come out of uh, my teaching and my research. Um, I'll also, um, as John noted, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll offer you a, um, a, a, an exercise that we can do during this period, um, an exercise that you can do with your cell phone, and I'll, uh, and I'll lead you through that. Um, we'll talk about the kinds of things that people tend to discover when they do these mindfulness exercises, and then I'll end with a short summary. So I am, um, by training, a computer scientist. I, I, I received my PhD in computer science from Stanford uh, a number of years ago. For nearly 20 years, I was a researcher at the very well-known uh, Silicon Valley think tank called Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. And for the past 15 years, I've been a professor in the information school here at the University of Washington. So I know the, the, the fast world of high tech and in many ways, I've thrived in, in that world. But at the same time, I feel that I have been um, uh, participating in and, and living through um, a complementary world, the slow world of craft and contemplation. Uh, I, I have a degree in calligraphy and bookbinding, studied in London for a couple of years. Um, that was probably my first contemplative practice, uh, calligraphy, that is. Uh, I have a long-standing, um, multiple-decade 
meditation practice and for a period of time, although no longer, I trained in the more contemplative martial art called Aikido. And throughout all of this time, these decades, um, living in the fast world and the slow world, the question, the personal as well as professional question for me has been, how do we balance living in these two worlds? Uh, what could balance actually look like? Starting about 20 years ago, I began to become aware of uh, certain challenging aspects of our use of digital technologies, even as I was a researcher in Silicon Valley. Um, concerns about the acceleration of life, of information overload, the fragmentation of attention, and an increasing sense of distraction. All of these, tw beginning 20 years ago, really caught my attention and suggested to me that there might be a kind of contemplative response to these, the, the, uh, to these concerns. Indeed, um, I began to ask the question, uh, one of the guiding questions for, for these years was, might it be possible for us to establish a healthier and more effective relationship with our digital devices and apps? And to what extent would a contemplative response be possible? And what would that actually look like? And over these years, I, I've really come to answer that question for myself. Um, the first part of the answer is yes, we can do this. I really believe that we can achieve greater agency or control over our digital devices and apps, that we don't have to be victims of them, that they don't have to control us. Indeed, I feel like we ourselves are the source of much of the knowledge that would allow us to achieve greater agency or control. And that by being observant of and reflective about our current digital and online habits and practices, that we are in, in actually in a position to, to, um, to make um, helpful and effective changes, which is indeed what we're going to be looking at um, during the rest of this webinar. So in other words, what I, what I have come to feel is that there is more wiggle room than we typically realize. Um, we can open up a space of greater choice and change and possibility than, than, than many of us have in the past realized. However, one caveat, um, I don't believe that the changes we make as individuals will solve all of our digital problems. Um, many of the problematic aspects of digital use, uh, digital use, such as how much email we receive, how much time we're online, what we're expected to accomplish, and so on. Um, many of these problematic aspects are the result of social and political decisions beyond the reach of individual choice. Indeed, there's a, another thread of my work, which I won't be talking about today, that's concerned with the social and political dimension. Some of that work goes by the title, No Time to Think. And if you like, if you want to pursue this, one of the places you can find uh, more information about this thread is in a 2010 CMIND webinar that I gave called No Time to Think. Okay, so um, how do we do this work? How, how might we go about it? Well, as I noted um, a couple of minutes ago, I've been teaching a course uh, since 2006 here at the University of Washington Information School, a course called Information and Contemplation. And it's in this course that I've done much of the experimentation that I'm actually talking to you about today. Um, I'm very grateful to the Center for Contemplative Mind, to CMIND, because uh, CMIND gave me in 2005-2006 a contemplative fellowship that allowed me to create this course. Here, by the way, on this slide is the opening of a very nice article that appeared in the Chronicle of Higher Education just a few years ago um, about this, this course. And it's, a, it's an article that you shouldn't have any trouble finding online. At the heart of the course on information and contemplation um, are five exercises listed on this slide that invite students to observe and, and, and reflect on their experience using their digital devices and apps. And as a result of this process of observation and reflection, to make changes to the way they use their, their devices and apps. 
In a few minutes, I'm going to say more about the content of these exercises. But right now, what I want to do is I want to give you a little taste of the work of, observe, of observing yourself using um, uh, your one device, namely your cell phone. I'm assuming that most of you, if not all of you, have a phone nearby. Um, but before we get to the cell phone exercise, the cell phone meditation, I want to introduce a simple mindfulness exercise that I use with students beginning in the very first week of class, which I call the mindful check-in. In all the mindful tech exercises that I do, it's crucial that people become aware of their immediate experience, of what's happening in their mind and body when they're online. So to give people and to give my students a sense of what it might mean to notice such things, I take them through the mindful check-in. Um, and what I'm going to do right now, in very briefly, because for limited time, I'm going to lead you through the mindful check-in. Normally, I would, I would take more time than this. But when I do the mindful check-in with my students or with other groups and workshops, I basically pose four questions, which I'm going to pose to you now, each of, one of, is, of which is going to ask you to look at some aspect of your immediate experience. By the way, for this particular exercise, you don't need to get into any kind of meditation posture. Um, you're, you're basically just checking in on exactly where you are and what you're experiencing right now. So let's go ahead with the mindful check-in. The first question I would ask you is, what's the quality of your breathing right now, wherever you notice it, in your belly, your chest, your nostrils, your throat? Is it fast or slow? Is your breathing shallow or deep? Is it ragged or perhaps smooth? Just take a quick moment to notice what the quality of your breathing is. Okay, the second question I'd like to ask you is just to notice the overall sense of your body. Where do you feel particular sensation? Maybe perhaps where your elbow is resting on a chair, chair arm or on, on the desk or um, how your bottom is on the chair or how your clothing feels. Um, are there places where you feel sensation, maybe discomfort or positive feelings? And is there absence of sensation in parts of your body? Also, while you're noticing your body, just have a look at, have, have a sense of what posture you're in without trying to change it. So take a moment just to notice what's going on with your body. The third question is, what's your current mood or emotional state? Are you excited? Are you anxious? Are you bored? Are you feeling up or down? You might have words to describe your current mood or emotional state. You might just have a feeling that you wouldn't even describe in words, or maybe you're not even sure what your mood or emotional state is. But just take a moment to see what you notice. And finally, the fourth and last question. See if you can notice the quality of your attention. Are you really focused, laser-like focused, so that it's been easy to listen to what I've been saying and, and easy for you to actually pay attention to what I'm asking you to pay attention to? Or maybe on the other extreme, um, your, your mind is really jumpy and distracted. Um, and it's been hard to pay attention, or somewhere in between. Whatever it is, is fine. But just take a moment to see if you can notice the quality of your attention. So thank you for doing that with me. As I said, I would normally take more time <clears throat> pausing longer between the different steps. Um, once, I, once I offer the, the mindful check-in to students, I then explain to them that these are the kinds of things about their mind and body that I'm going to be asking them to
to pay attention to when they do the mindful tech exercises. I'm not going to suggest that you or they um, run through a list of these, but just to notice which things are most, most salient. Um, and so, with that as a kind of background, let's move on to the cell phone meditation. <clears throat> Basically, what's going to happen over the next um, five or seven minutes is I'm going to ask you to undertake a series of actions with your cell phone. And while you're doing them, to notice what's arising in your mind and body. To help you with this, I suggest you have a piece of paper next to you where you write down the numbers one through five. If, if, of course, if you can get to a piece of paper easily, you don't have to do this exercise by writing anything down. Um, by, but by putting these numbers one to five on a page, um, these, these numbers will, be, will correspond to the five actions that I'm going to ask you to perform to, to the five steps. And when I give you the instructions for each of these steps, I'm going to ask you to write down a few words or phrases describing what happened when you undertook that action. In other words, what happened in your immediate experience. So for example, suppose in step three, I said to you, throw your phone against the wall. Obviously, I'm not going to ask you to do that. Um, but if I did ask you to do that, obviously certain things would come up in your mind and body. You might hold your breath. You might suddenly feel anxious. You might actually think, no, I'm not going to do that. Certain things would arise, and then after, as you did it or did not do what I was asking you to do, you'd write down a few words or phrases next to the number three on your piece of paper. Okay, just a few more things and we're going to get started. I suggest that to start the exercise that you actually put your phone away. Um, <clears throat> uh, at the very least, don't be holding on to it and don't be looking at it. Um, it could be in a pocket or a bag or just on the desk or chair a little bit of a distance from you. Second, um, please wait until I finish the instructions for each step before doing anything. And finally, um, uh, for those of you who are or will be listening to this as a recorded webinar, uh, you of course can always um, stop the recording if you want to take more time. I, because of limited time, I'm going to run through this exercise more quickly than I would typically do with a group of students. Okay, so here goes. Step number one, think about your cell phone. I don't want you to hold it. I don't want you to take it out. I simply want you to call to mind your cell phone. Notice what's arising in your mind and body when you think about your cell phone and take a moment to write down a few words or phrases describing what you noticed. Okay, thank you for doing that. Step number two. Now I'd like you to take out your phone and hold it in your hand, but don't unlock it or turn it on. And once again, see what arises in your mind and body when you do this, and write down a few words or phrases. Okay, thank you for step number two. And now let's move on to step number three. Now I do want you to turn on and unlock your phone and open your email inbox. Uh, and then I'd like you to scan the headers in your inbox, but please don't open or read any of the messages. So please go ahead, 
scan your inbox and see what happens in your mind and body when you do that and write down a few words or phrases. Okay, thank you. And now, now let's move on to step number four. Now I do want you to open and read a message. I say here, if you have the time to respond quickly, you can do that as well, but it, since we're doing this exercise in such an abbreviated form, I suggest that you only open and read a message. And again, notice what arises in your experience as you do this, and write down a few words or phrases. Okay, thank you. That was step number four. And then for step number five, I'd like you to notice what kind of reaction you have to just hearing the instructions and then also what you do when you carry them out. Step number five, put your phone away. Put it out of sight, put it in a pocket, whatever you need to do to put it away and see what arises in your mind and body and write down a few words or phrases. Okay, thank you. That's the exercise in abbreviated form. Um, when I use this exercise in the classroom or in a workshop, I also allow time for debriefing, which is a very important part of the exercise. Uh, that is for some people to report back what they noticed when they did it. But in the interest of time in this webinar, I'm not going to do that since I'd rather reserve time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. But at the very least, I hope by doing this exercise ever so briefly, you got a sense of what I mean by observing your mind and body while you're online. And you may also have seen how this kind of observation has the potential to illuminate your relationship with, your, with a device or app. For example, you might have noticed some anxiety when you scanned your inbox, which might have been reflected as well in your breath and posture. You might have noticed some pleasure at taking your phone out and disappointment when you were asked to put it away, or perhaps even the opposite. But the next step in doing this kind of work is, is to figure out how to make use of these kinds of observations as the basis for reflecting and ultimately making changes. What I'm basically suggesting here is that observation matters. In this kind of observation matters, as I've been seeing for over 10 years of doing this work with students and adult practitioners. It matters because it actually reveals our current online habits, what we tend to do, and even why we tend to do what we tend to do. And this introduce, introduces and opens up the question, what can I change? What can I change in my external circumstances? Maybe. Um, uh, um, when I use my phone or my laptop or how many windows I have open, um, but also what I can change in my internal circumstances. If I notice certain problematic emotions and states of mind arising, 
when I'm using my phone or, um, or, or some, some other app or device, maybe there are things that I can do to establish um, a, a more effective and a more balanced relationship. Okay, so, so th that gives you a little feeling, I hope, of this mini exercise of something and something that you could even potentially do with your own students. It doesn't take a lot of preparation. And what I've discovered is simply doing this exercise and then opening up uh, the classroom for conversation can lead in some very interesting directions. But as I said earlier, at the heart of my course is a series of longer exercises, each one of which typically takes a week to 10 days. I'm not going to describe these in depth. You can learn more about them in the Journal of Contemplative Inquiry article that John mentioned and also in my book, Mindful Tech. But I do want to give you a bit of a sense of, um, of what the flow and the content of these five exercises is. Let's start with the first one, the email observation exercise. Basically what I do here is over the course of a week, I ask students 15 to 20 minutes a day to observe themselves using email in just the ways that we've been talking about observing. And I ask them to keep a log of their observations. So you'll notice, by the way, that the cell phone meditation exercise we just did is essentially a brief encapsulation of these first two steps. But there are two other really crucial steps um, that, uh, that follow. At the end of a week of such observation and uh, logging, I ask students to review their notes and to write a reflection typically two to three pages long, which includes suggestions for personal guidelines that they might now try to establish, things that they would change about how they do email based on what they've been observing. And then the next crucial step is that these reflections are shared with everybody else in the class. And we come back together into the classroom um, to talk at length about the kinds of things that people have been discovering, to see similarities and differences, so that a lot of the learning happens not only in the individual observations and reflections, but in the shared uh, and very rich and often r really enjoyable conversation that happens as people look at everyone else's um, uh, reflections. <clears throat> so that's the first of the exercises. All of them basically have a this similar structure. Do something for a week, keep a log, um, write a written reflection, and share it with everyone else. The next exercise, number two, called focused email, is one in which I suggest to people that they could do email in a more mindful or focused way by noticing the moments when they tend to get distracted and want to wander off to something else and simply bring their attention back again and again to email. Then in the next two exercises we move on to multitasking which of course is a very interesting and charged subject. Uh, multitasking by which I mean um, typically rapid movement between different apps and windows and devices. <clears throat> and in the first of these exercises, I ask students simply to observe themselves in a multitasking situation where they may be trying to do multiple things on their laptop. They may also be texting or using the phone in, in other ways. Um, and there's an additional uh, thing that I ask people to do because multitasking can be much harder to do as a simple self-observation practice. I ask students to download software onto their, um, onto their laptops so they can actually essentially create a video of themselves moving between windows and apps and they can even be recording the sound and if they want the webcam of them doing all of this um, so that they have a video that they can go back to and look at as part of trying to understand what their current habits and strategy around multitasking are. Then in exercise number four, which parallels exercise number two, I give them, um, I, I suggest to them that there is actually a way to do multitasking in a much more mindful or focused way, which may sound like an oxymoron, but isn't. I mean, it's something if you want to talk about in the, in the Q&A period, we can go into further. And so over the course of a week, they try out this mindfulness exercise, being mindful as they multitask. And then in the last of the five exercises, um, I, I ask them to commit for a minimum of 24 hours to, um, to give up 
at least one device or at least one app that they really care about over that period of time to notice what happens in their mind and body, especially when they feel the impulse or the craving to go back to, to whatever they've let go of. And then, of course, again, they end up uh, keeping a log and writing a reflection and everybody um, uh, reads uh, one another's and we talk about it. So what do people discover uh, in the course of these exercises? I've noticed a number of common themes, um, the kinds of discoveries that people regularly make. And I, I, of course, only have a few minutes to talk about them. I've listed seven uh, overall themes. Uh, people discover how powerful and useful self-observation is. They see that the, the effects that strong emotions have on their online behavior. They discover more than they realized before how inattentive they can often be, but also at times, surprisingly, how attentive. They discover that focused attention has even more value, perhaps, than they realize, and that the breath and the body are really important indicators um, and really allies in this work. And overall, they, they really do begin to discover uh, the, the larger premise of all this work, which is that it is possible to make wiser decisions about when to be online and when not to be online. So what I'm going to do uh, for the next few minutes is I'm going to give you a sense of some of the things that people discover. I'm, I've picked four of these topics and I'm going to read you um, uh, actual student uh, reflections from each of these four, four topics. So on, this, on the topic of, of uh, self-observation, this one student says, my favorite part of this exercise was the level of attention I was giving to my habits. Before paying attention this week, I never really knew what I was doing. I've often described the experience of bouncing mindlessly along the internet as an internet blackout. Thankfully, instead of waking up on a dirty sidewalk with no shoes or money in Las Vegas, I just wake up somewhere out there on the internet. I'll find myself looking at animated GIFs of Beyonce at the Super Bowl and have no idea how I got there. I am sure that paying attention to my habits is the first step to helping me focus when I need to and to resist the deliciously tempting distractions of the Internet. Of course, I love this quote. I mean, it's very rich, funny, and, and appropriate. And that last sentence really gets at, uh, I think, one of the crucial bits of learning that paying attention to your habits is the first step in learning how to do better. Or this one from a student talking about what, what she's discovering about strong emotions. <clears throat> she says, why the incessant need to check email? Because I did not want to be in that moment of waiting for the bus to arrive, waiting for the bus to, del to deliver me, waiting for Guffman, waiting for the coffee to be made, waiting for class to start waiting. I did not want to be waiting for anything. I wanted to be active with my schoolwork, complete work tasks, remove myself from the head spin of stressing over my to-do list, not waiting. It's clear to me that I've been using this outlet as a way to dissociate from the moment because I am overwhelmed. So what a beautiful and honest statement. And clearly, once this student has realized that she's using checking as a way to deal with something else more basic, namely feeling overwhelmed, it clearly opens up a space of choice. Do you want to use checking email as a way to deal with being overwhelmed, or, you, or are there other things that you might want to change in your life? Again, it's not for me to tell this student what she should do, but for them to actually see this is then to begin to, to take the first step to actually answering it in ways that will be effective for her. Or this one, the value of focused attention. Telling myself to focus on email actually helped make the process less stressful. I had permission to let go of things because it was time for my email and email only. Focusing on one thing is less stressful than panicking about 50. That last sentence is, could make a wonderful uh, bumper sticker for all of us. Um, and it's, it's self-evident what she's saying, but she discovered that actually there's, there can be a kind of relief in giving oneself permission just to focus on the task at hand. And finally, as a kind of summary of all of this, um, a student says, um, B 
being able to direct your attention and choose what to pay attention to is, I believe, an essential coping mechanism to deal with all these new voices, all these new things that are demanding our attention. When we're mindful, we choose to pay attention to what is explicitly important to us. Being mindful begins to reveal our values in a way wandering lost through the digital landscape can never do. Again, I call your, your attention to that last sentence. Um, being mindful begins to reveal our values. In other words, there's an ethical dimension. We can begin to see what we're doing and, what we, and whether we're valuing what we really want to value. So what a, what a beautiful thing. And what a beautiful um, set of observations and practices students have been making over the last 10 years. Lastly, I just want to call your attention to examples of the personal guidelines that people tend to write. I'll give you two of them. One student says, take five deep breaths before opening my inbox. This will help me check in with my body and hopefully become more aware of how my inner state affects how I see the world in email. Again, what a beautiful thing to be able to notice and hopefully to begin to practice. Because, our, of course, our inner states really do profoundly affect what we do online. And then this um, additional guideline. <clears throat> when I notice the internal tug to engage with email or Facebook and there is not a real need, I will be mindful of it and ask myself why. I might still engage with these technologies even if a, quote, need does not exist but it will be with a more mindful interaction. Part of what I love about this is this student has really gotten the sense of his or her autonomy is really what's, issue in, it's at, what, what's at issue in order um, to, to be smart online. Um, my pedagogical approach is not to tell other people what they should do. And here he or she is basically saying, well, if I can be mindful enough to ask why I'm tempted to go to email or Facebook, I'm in a position to decide whether I want to go there in the moment or not. And even if there isn't a real need, I might still decide to do it. Okay, so let's move into uh, the last few slides, which are the, my, my summary. Um, I do believe, and I hope that in these um, few minutes I've given you a little sense, I do believe that we really can achieve greater agency or control. We, we are sources of a great deal of that knowledge, at which we can access by simply being observant and reflective of our inner states um, while we're online and thus being able to see our current habits and practices. And this is very good news because we open up a space of choice and there is real wiggle room, even though this, can't, uh, this shouldn't prevent us from social and political action that will change the things that are not simply up to us as individuals. So to end, I want to end by showing you this image, um, <clears throat> which I've used in um, a variety of talks over probably close to 10 years since I first saw this ad. It's an ad for the IBM ThinkPad. In, uh, I first saw it in the New York Times Magazine. Um, it shows a man sitting uh, in front of his laptop, uh, with his laptop on his lap. Um, and then, I don't know if you can actually read the ad copy, but it says, in deep halcyon repose. And it gives the dictionary definition for halcyon as peaceful. When I first saw this, I just thought, wow, I'm going to be able to use this ad. Because what is it doing? I mean, what are, what are the advertisers essentially saying? They're saying, well, look, you can take your IBM ThinkPad laptop anywhere. You could even take it to a place like the library, like the stacks of a library, which I think still in our culture symbolizes the contemplative dimension of life, um, a place where there is quiet and focus and where there's institutional support for being more balanced and more, and more contemplative. So I love this ad because it suggests that we can combine the old and the new, the contemplative and the digital, the fast and the slow. <clears throat> the first time that I, that I showed this ad, just uh, probably a week after I discovered it in the New York Times, I was giving a talk here at the Information School. And there was, uh, in the audience was 
a woman named Joyce Ogburn, who then was one of the associate deans of the University of Washington Libraries. And Joyce said, you know, David, I just heard about this ad, and somebody said that it was actually uh, shot here at the University of Washington, to which I said, well, how could that be? I mean, this is probably a New York advertising agency or maybe an LA advertising agency. Why in the world would they take a picture here at the University of Washington? And Joyce said, well, they told me it was in uh, the East Asia Library that the picture was taken. So we went down there um, and actually discovered that the chair was still in that same place in front of the window. And this is, I, I assure you, not a Photoshop job. This is me sitting in the same chair with Joyce trying to take a picture that echoes. Um, so what a wonderful, quirky, cosmic, maybe a little spooky thing that seemed to happen, um, that, that this seemed to, be, uh, to be, have a much more personal uh, dimension. But the message that I, that I have tended to take uh, away from this little story is just that the things that we're talking about in this webinar, our relationship to our devices and apps and to the world, that, uh, the way that we are, relate to the world through these very powerful devices and apps, that all of this is really very close to home. And, and in fact, if we take, pay attention to it from within our own home, our own bodies and minds, that we'll learn a whole lot of things that will really help us. Um, so thank you, everyone. You'll see that I've included on this slide my email address if you'd like to be in touch with me, and also um, my University of Washington website, as well as my um, uh, non-UW personal website. So I invite you to be in touch if you want to follow up on any of this. And now um, we have about 15, 17, maybe as much as 20 minutes for questions and comments. So thank you all very much for being part of this. And John, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. So thank you so much, David, um, for sharing your work with us. And um, we got a few questions coming in. So um, I'll just be reading the questions as they come in. And so while I'm doing this, I invite others to type in your questions. So the first question is from Merlin um, Holmes. And um, the question is, can you tell us more about how to do focused multitasking? Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, that's a good one. Thank you. Um, so the way I talk about it is follows. Um, the, the challenge, we, I start off by saying that there are two, that multitasking works because we have two modes of attention. We have the ability to narrow down on something specific, to read an email message or to listen to somebody talking to us. But we also have peripheral attention. And that's what allows us um, to, for example, hear a beep or notice that another window has become active. And in fact, we need both focused and open attention in order to, to cross a busy street. Because if you couldn't focus on getting across the street, um, you would never get there. And if you couldn't notice that maybe a, a car had run a stop sign and was in danger of hitting you, you might be in trouble. So multitasking works because we have both of these modes of attention available to us. And so the challenge in multitasking is at any moment to figure out which thing we actually want to pay attention to. Do I want to, if, if I'm reading the current email message, do I want to continue to read it? Meanwhile, as I'm reading that email message, other things can arise, both externally and internally, that um, represent additional choices that I might make. So I'm reading an email message and suddenly I hear a beep on my phone that suggests that I've received a text message. Or I'm reading this email message and suddenly I feel anxious about it because of its content. And so the challenge in, in, in doing mindful multitasking is, first of all, when you're focusing on something, to, to be focused on it, but then to notice those peripheral claims to your attention. There goes that beep, oh, I'm feeling anxious. And then at that moment to be able to pause and say, I have the choice to, I have the opportunity to make a mindful choice. Do I st stay with reading my email message or do I go to that beep or, uh, um, 
or do it back because I'm anxious, do I go distract myself by, by going to Facebook or something like that. So in other words, the crucial idea in mindful multitasking is not just to go on habit energy and unconsciously jump from things to thing, from thing to thing, but to notice that I suddenly, there are other things claiming my attention and to make a mindful choice. That's about probably is all, all that I can say in this really constrained amount of time. But if you want to, you'll see, uh, of course, uh, uh, there are two chapters on multitasking in my book, Mindful Tech. So thank you very much for that excellent question. Um, and David, before I read the next question, um, someone typed in asking if you might put the slide back to your contact information. Oh, sure. And our next question, um, so our, our, the talk here is on higher education, but the question is um, how best to work with kids. So in particular, I have a 10-year-old boy. Yes, I, I hear that question a lot. And I'm afraid I can only give you a partial answer. Um, I don't operate in, in the world of K through 12. Um, I don't have children. <clears throat> My answer is, um, that I think the most important thing would be for you to do these kinds of exercises yourself and then to see which of these, to see if any of the exercises themselves are adaptable um, to your 10-year-old or um, to see once you've gotten the basic idea um, of, of, of observing and learning from observing and making changes, maybe you can come up with your own exercises. By the way, I'm going to be speaking at a at an education conference in uh, in San Diego next month, where I will partly be addressing the, the issue of K-12. Um, the other thing I would say that comes up a lot um, and has been written a, a lot is um, we are, of course, examples for um, for those for our children and our younger students, and so it's not unusual for younger. Um, for kids to actually be copying what their parents are doing. So to the extent that you can come up uh, with, with what you think of as healthier and more effective ways that you can be demonstrating simply by example uh, to your child, that might also be a way to go forward. By the way, if you work things out, if you figure things out, I would love to hear. And, I, and I'll add one other, one other point, which is the use of technology, uh, for example, the use of, of, of um, uh, downloading something onto a laptop where a, a child could actually create a video of themselves doing various things. I've begun to wonder if that might not be a kind of fun game uh, where a parent and a child would look at uh, a recording of what the child was doing and begin to talk about it. Anyway, thank you for that question. So we still have um, time for more questions. So if you have questions, please go ahead and type them in. So I'll just wait to see if other questions come in. Let me also suggest while we're waiting for more questions, um, if anything came up for you around the cell phone meditation that you want to, you want to tell me or the, or the rest of the group that you and you might want me to comment on, feel free to feel feel free, feel free to do that as well. Oh, and we do have other questions here, I'm sorry. So um, here we have a question for, um, from Mary um, Adji. says, thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, I'm inspired to start some conversation with faculty at my K-12 independent school in Nashville. So more of a comment there. Um, so here a question from Alan Schusterman. The focus seems to be on device, app, user experience, but I suspect that there's a social element. Text or email connects me to someone. Do your students talk about social factors? Thank you. That's a wonderful question. Absolutely. A lot of what actually emerges in the actual in, in the exercise and the reflection is um, serious reflection on the social, the social dimension, on the fact that I'm connecting to somebody else, and that the strong emotions that are are often arising have not only to do with the technology but have to do with the person that I'm actually connecting with. So that's exactly right. Although I, I, it's almost like I don't have to specifically call out the social because it, it, it's really present. And in the, by the way, in the, in the last of the five exercises, the unplugging exercise, many people 
uh, over the years have chosen to to get off social media, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or more recently Snapchat and so on. And it, and that's where, especially when people make a decision not to use social media, that the, the social dimension comes up in, in very powerful ways. So again, thank you. That was a wonderful question. Um, so David, next question. Um, You've mentioned how the course has opened up space internally and externally for your students. Have you explored linking it with a mindfulness course that would expand their mindful awareness to other areas too? Or do students express interest in mindfulness practice after they have done with your course? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, b before I answer it, let me say something I didn't mention before, which is the course is actually open to undergraduates, masters, and PhD students at the university. So I, I, I love getting the mix of ages and experience. Um, some students come to the course because they already have exposure to mindfulness. And some have actually you know, taken something like a mindfulness-based stress reduction course, or they're connected to some sort of Dharma center. So there definitely are students of different ages who are already um, connected to that. Um, then, indeed, there are students who as a result of this um, um, work, they express interest in going, in going further. I'm always happy to suggest local resources to them, but I don't make a big point of it. Um, I just allow them to connect with me. By the way, one of the wonderful things that's happened in, the, in recent years on the University of Washington campus is we have something um, student-initiated and student-led called the UW Mindfulness Project which offers um, uh, various mindfulness practices and yoga um, and has about a thousand students who are registered, um, which is an amazing thing. So and again, thank you for that question. And David, we have another question um, that points to an article in Slate magazine about, quote, how the modern world is bad for you, for you and your brain, that multitasking effectively lowers your IQ. Um, for example, email beats lowers the IQ by 10 points. So the question is um, regarding studies that multitasking is in the end far less efficient or effective than single tasking and whether you agree with this. Yes, that's another great question. Uh, and I do write about this in, in the book. Um, first of all, yes, there are really studies that show multitasking is, is less efficient and, and effective. For, the perp for my own pedagogical purposes in this piece of work, I remain agnostic about multitasking. Um, if you think of multitasking as, first and foremost, the ability to shift one's attention between one object of attention and another, then if from that broad perspective, we need that set of skills. You know, when you're driving, you need to, at times, to notice something on the side of the road, not something right in front of you, right? Um, and so the training that that I, I'm suggesting, that I'm offering in being able to make mindful decisions about when to shift and when not to um, are actually very important uh, sk life skills. Um, I also notice, by the way, um, that the assumption, there, there's kind of an assumption that, um, that, that everything we do should be efficient and effective. And well, why should, I mean, maybe that's not right. Maybe that's buying in too much to our more faster, better, better, accelerating consumerist and, and, and production-oriented culture. I would rather say, uh, again, from the, from the pedagogical view that I'm representing in this current work, as opposed to in some of the other ways that I talk about, uh, the social and the political, um, I would rather say, let's figure out when it's skillful and appropriate to multitask and, and when not. So again, thank you for that. So we have um, many, many questions coming in, so we won't be able to get to all of them today, but I'll ask um, two together right here, David, that are related. Um, so one question is, could you speak to the use of uh, technology like online gaming and Netflix? And then we have another related question. Um, um, have you dealt with mindful doctoring with the electronic medical record? Uh -huh. Uh huh. Well, those, okay. I'm not sure how closely related those two are, but I'm happy to address both of them. <laughs> um, so, um, 
Yes, I mean, issues like video games and Netflix and, of course, YouTube and all of that, those things definitely come up. I don't know if the questioner is, is getting going in this direction, but in my course, I actually do bring an, uh, somebody in, a woman, a, 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 a clinical psychologist who's a friend and colleague named Hillary Cash to talk about video game addiction, which is itself a huge topic, and I'm not going to be able to get into it now. Um, but indeed, um, if the direction that you're going with that question is, do we have to worry about the extent to which we get maybe too strongly pulled into, into some of our online stuff? Yes, of course. That's something um, that I think we all need to look at. By and large, the people that I'm, I'm working with are not deeply addicted. All of us are just feel the, feel the pull. So, so, but we do actually have a very interesting whole class discussion of, of whether there is such a thing as addiction and what that might look like. Um, interestingly, then, moving on to the question about the, the medical record, um, I've been finding, especially locally, that the medical community has, has have been inviting me to give talks on this subject. I've given three and maybe I'm about to give a fourth talk um, in, the, in the Seattle area to people, to doctors and to other uh, medical professionals and staff who are very interested and concerned with this. So, if, so I'm, I'm, getting a lot of, um, I, I'm getting a lot of interest and I'm very interested in talking to the medical community. Thank you for both of those questions. Do we have time for one more, do you think, uh, John? Yes, so how about if I offer one, one more question, and then there are some other questions here that, um, it, so I'm saying to participants, if you pose a question that I'm not able to ask, I would encourage you to email your question to David, who I'm sure would love to answer um, for you. So that, That's um, right. Uh, pl please do send your questions to me. I'd love to see them. And so the, I'll just, the last question I'll ask is um, whether you are aware of any instructors at your institution or elsewhere who have incorporated any of these techniques into their, quote, regular courses? I, I'm not aware of anybody doing uh, it here at the University of Washington, but I have been hearing from people at other, at other universities who, do, who, who are doing some of this work. And I'll just say that, you know, I, 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 I'm always welcome, I'm always uh, uh, interested in being invited to other campuses to do some of this work and to spread these ideas, but yes, indeed, there, there are people that I've, um, I've been able to talk with in person at other campuses who are beginning to incorporate some of these ideas. And I also hear from people with some regularity. So I'm really excited. And if any of you want to take on some of these practices or want my help in, in helping you think through how you might incorporate them, please be in touch with me. And I think we're done. So John, I'm going to turn it over to you. And I'm going to thank all of you. Um, what a delight to have a chance to be connected with you, and I look forward to more opportunities. John? Yes. Um, so again, thank you, David, for sharing your work with us, and to everyone for joining us today. So I just want to remind everyone that this webinar has been recorded, and it will be made available on the website soon. So our webinars are made possible by your support, and so we invite you to make a donation and check out our webinar archive at contemplativemind.org. So please know that your donation allows us at CMind to continue supporting teachers, student affairs professionals, and others in integrating contemplative practices and approaches in higher education contexts in service of a more just and compassionate society. And so again, we'll be sending out a follow-up email with a link to this recording that will also include some announcements for upcoming events. So for now, I'll just announce our next webinar that will take place on Thursday, March 2nd with John Brammer and Pearl Ratnall and will focus specifically on the challenges and possibilities of integrating contemplative approaches in the community college context. So again, thank you for participation this afternoon. Please do um, send David any follow-up questions you might have, and we look forward to your participation in future webinars. Bye-bye.